Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Monday Mindset. I am Tracy Rader, the Director of Implementation here at Giant, and I have with me uh, the the Master of Ceremony. No, not the Master of Ceremonies. You are the show, Kevin DeShazo. Always good to have you. How was your weekend? Uh, it was fantastic, actually. Went went to the lake, got a little bit of rest, uh, had some basketball games for our kids, had dinner with friends last night, got a nap in, got a couple runs in. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty great weekend. Uh, how about you? Well, good. Uh, kind of, sort of, same, but not really. Lots of people through our house, had some people over Friday night for dinner, and then Saturday uh, did some fun stuff. Yeah, lots of people, which is what I love. So. Um, so we've got a great guest on again. And so once again, I want to leave most of our time for our guests. So I am going to do as I usually do when we have an interview and that's, I'm going to exit here in a second and kind of watch the chat. So if y'all are joining, joining us from LinkedIn or Facebook or the giant platform, welcome. We want lots of interaction here. And so if you have questions for our guests or comments, we want to hear those. I'll come on at the end and, uh, and see what we can do with all of those questions. So Kevin, take it away and introduce uh, our special guest today. Absolutely. I am, I'm fired up today. We get to bring in uh, a friend, Bronson Taylor. And Bronson is the CEO of Giant, um, has been since August-ish, I believe. But Bronson is a, is a visionary. He's a pioneer. He's an innovator. Um, I, I've gotten to know him over the past, I guess, couple of years, really, and, and could not be more just impressed um, with, with the man he is, but the way that he operates, the way he does business, the vision that he has. I've never seen someone so good at like having this crazy vision and then actually bringing it to life. Um, so most of what you see on the giant platform is a result of Bronson's not just vision, but execution. Um, and the growth of giant and the, the trajectory that it's on is, is a lot of the result of his visionary leadership. So Mr. Taylor, welcome to the Monday Mindset. Kevin, it's so good to be here. Thanks for the uh, very warm welcome. I get too much credit for everything the team does, uh, but but thank you. <laughs> so, let's, so before we dig in, let's let's give the thirty second or one minute version of who is Bronson Taylor. You're the CEO of Giant now, but but what has led you up to this point? Yeah, uh, the quick version. Uh, grew up in rural Kentucky. Uh, when I was young, I got introduced to a computer. Uh, really cool story. My dad who, uh, you know, was a, a mechanic who, you know, didn't have a lot of means. He decided that computers were the future way before other people realized it. And he put a computer on layaway. So he brought it home and he pays on it every week from a salary at work. And so we had this good computer, even though our uh, status, our class should not have had that computer. And it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. So my brother and I, we just hacked on that thing day in and day out. And we realized it might be our ticket out. It, it might be the thing that we can become world class at. So we were just enamored with technology. And then when the internet came around, um, I really saw it as a place to just expand my mind. I could have access to any information. It was the largest library ever. It was larger than the library of Alexandria ever thought about being. It was the place where wisdom was possible, knowledge was possible. So I just started consuming as much information as possible. And that just led to one thing after another. And we started becoming serial entrepreneurs, my brother and I. So we would start companies. Uh, a lot of them would fail. Some would succeed. We did some bootstrap companies. We did some venture capital backed companies. Um, but we learned a lot throughout the whole process. And they were all technology based. Eventually, we got into Techstars. And it was an accelerator for businesses, which is harder to get into than Harvard. Um, and so we we're really proud to be able to get into that program and be able to build companies underneath their umbrella. And then eventually, um, I met Mike Opadal. Uh, we had mutual friends that said, you all should get coffee. So me and him got coffee. And it was really interesting because we were both trying to serve the other one. He was trying to figure out how to serve me. And I was trying to figure out how to serve him because that's how we both just live our life. And then we realized at the end, we're both unique. We're probably going to be friends let's let's do this again let's talk more and so we ended up just having a series of coffees which led to a partnership uh with giant and then eventually my role here so that's my uh quick history if that helps i love it and for those who don't know mike opadal uh, is now the president of giant we interviewed him a few months back on monday mindset um, i can only imagine the energy uh that was exchanged during, during those meetings and the visionary things that were happening uh, so one of the things you talked about there was is you know, you and your brother Lucas kind of became serial entrepreneurs. And, and with that, there's a certain mindset that entrepreneurs have. And so, and part of that is dealing with failure, right? You said a lot of those companies failed, some succeeded. Um, I think failure is something our culture kind of runs from. 
right? We love, we love to play it safe. Um, how have you learned to not just overcome failure, but, but deal with it and be, I don't say be okay with it, but realize it's kind of part of the process. Yeah. So here's the thing. Failure doesn't care if you're okay with it. It's going to happen. So you have to decide to be okay with it or not, but it's going to happen. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as a successful person who has, has not encountered more failure than the average person. You have to become accustomed to it. Not that you like it, not that you enjoy it, not that you chase after it, not that you settle for it, but you have to become very okay with its existence because the more times you fail, the closer you are to succeeding. Um, and so I think we just have to become okay with the fact that to do anything novel, to do anything important, to do anything difficult, you're going to have to fail. If you are living a life that lacks failure, then you're not pushing your own boundaries. Um, if you're not failing a little bit every day, you're not failing a little bit every week, if you're not failing a little bit every month, every year, then you're playing it safe. You're doing things you already know how to do. You're doing things that you're just you're doing a recipe. You're already you're just following something that you know is not going to fail. And so then you can say, "Oh, I'm I'm not a failure." Are are you though? Are you really not a failure if you're not failing? I would say that's the counterintuitive approach to to the whole thing. Yeah, you're really just embracing average and considering that yeah. success, right? Like I'm I'm successful at being average is is really what you're saying. And I I, I remember hearing a quote years ago. Um, I think it was Sarah Blakely, the CEO of Spanx, and she said that her dad would would pick them up every day from school. And the question he asked was, hey, what did you fail at today? And he was trying to get into his kids at a young age, like failure is fine. Like that means you're, you're trying things that are scary. You're trying things that are new and you're overcoming and you're learning and you're growing. So when they were 25, 30, 45 years old, failure isn't something they're afraid of. Again, it's just something that they they embrace. Um, one of my favorite stories of yours is, is when you and Lucas were starting a web design company. Um, so I'll let you tell the story, but I really want to get to the mindset behind um, what 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 kind of person does this, right? Like it's, it's just starting a business, you have you have to be crazy, right? The world has made being an entrepreneur like really sexy, and it's not. Like there's nothing sexy about being an entrepreneur. It's hard, it's stressful, it's exhausting. Um, but but if you're an entrepreneur, you love that part of it too. And so talk about your story as you and Lucas were trying to build this web design company in Florida. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're in, we, I live in a shack at the time. And when I say shack, it, it's a shack. I mean, we're talking 400 square foot down by the river. Um, it's like, <laughs> I've got to get out of this place. Uh, if I were to show you photos of it, it would be hilarious. Right. And so we decided to start a web design business because it's what we knew. We knew how to design websites. We didn't have any monetary resources. We didn't have connections. We didn't have a way to really get things going easily. We just knew how to build websites. We were good at that. So we came up with an idea and we said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get in my trooper, my uh, 1993 Isuzu trooper, right? And I'm going to drive around my town and Lucas is going to be on a voice with, uh, phone call with me on speaker. And I'm going to tell him what roads I'm driving down. And he's going to be pulling up the websites of those businesses. And when he finds a website that uh, needs an update, is outdated, um, doesn't exist, you know, whatever it may be, he's going to tell me, I'm going to pull into that business. I'm going to go in, try to sell him a website. And it's like, you know, was there a better idea? Probably. Was there an easier idea? Maybe. But you know what? That's what we had. So we're like, all right, let's just go. So I get in the trooper. I start going and we go in and I just start knocking on doors. Uh, and so I remember going past these, you know, no soliciting signs and I would go in and the, the owner would say, didn't you see the no soliciting sign? And I would say, you know, I'm trying to feed my family at home. I'm sorry, but I can't obey no soliciting signs today. I just have to share with you what I can do. And I think there's value for you, you if you'll give me a couple minutes of your time. And almost every time they're like, I respect that. Come on back here. Let's talk. And so they actually respect the hustle. They respect somebody that says humbly. I can't say uh, I can't settle for what you want me to settle for. So we did that for a while with the trooper. And then, you know, it was a 93 trooper. Eventually it broke down. And so it's like, well, the show must go on. So I had an old Schwinn 10 speed. Uh, so I, you know, bring it out, get it going. I start riding around in the. And, and you're what, like six foot, six foot four? Yeah. Six, four. I'm in July heat in Florida. I'm on a Schwinn. I've got the uh, the earphones in so I can hear Lucas as he's talking to me. We do the same thing. I mean, I look ridiculous. I really do. I remember going into a dentist office, park my Schwinn. He's like, they need a new website. I was like, all right. I look at myself. I'm just dripping sweat. And I'm like, ah. Oh. And I mean, every, I felt embarrassed. I felt like I shouldn't be at this place in my career at this point. 
I felt like I'm going to walk in and they're going to laugh at me. And I'm just, I remember sitting in front of that dentist office and like looking at this nice building and then looking at me on a, on a bicycle with this, this sweat in my armpits and thinking, what am I doing? And then I just, I was like, all right, pull it together. I was like, I know what I'm doing. I'm hustling. I'm trying to feed my family. I've got to keep my eye on the prize. That's what I'm doing here today. It's not about them. It's not about how they see me. It's not about what they think. I don't care if they laugh. I'm going to walk in the office and I'm going to do what I do. And if they ask me to leave, it's fine. So I went in. I looked ridiculous. I didn't get a sell that day, but I got something better. I got a notch in my belt. I went through the door when I was actually a little bit embarrassed by myself. And I kept doing that over and over and over. And you know what's funny is you start building a little business and all of a sudden, you're doing some websites. I remember my first client was $2,000. Just one time fee, $2,000. I was like, all right, $2,000. So split that with my brother. We got $1,000 each. Here we go. You know, we, we do a few more. We get $4,000. And then I remember walking one day. Finally, I got enough money to, you know, to, to have a car again. And finally, you know, I was able to get in front of a guy who needed a legit large website. And the price tag was $30,000. And I was like, yeah, we can do it for that. And he's like, have you ever done any of this stuff before that we're asking you to do? I was like, no. But I promise you, we're the kinds of people that'll figure it out. He's like, you know what? I believe you. So he cut us a check for thirty thousand dollars. I remember I came home to my shack and I'm like, okay, we're starting something here. So we started working on stuff at a little higher dollar amount. Then I remember there was a TechStars program, and I'm like, I think we can get into this. So I called the guy who was running it, and I was like, hey, you know, uh, this is where our business is at. This is how much money we're making. I really want to get into TechStars. And he said, you know, all right, I'll have my assistant talk to you, and we'll see what we can do. So she called a week later or so. And she's like, yeah, they've decided no, they're not going to let you in. So then I was like, all right, thanks, hung up. And then I'm sitting there, I'm like, no, nah, I don't accept that answer. Called her back because, you know, I had her, had her number since she called me. And I was like, hey, I was like, I, I thought you said no, and that's the wrong answer. Sorry. She goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's just the wrong answer. Like, I don't know what has to happen next, but that's not the right answer. She's like, look, I can talk to him and see what he says. But she's like, you know, I was like, talk to him. I was like, I'm here. So finally he calls me back. He goes, all right, what is it about you? He's like, you just won't go away. He's like, you, there's something about you that's different. He goes, I tell you what, he goes, if you can get $20,000 in recurring revenue by Christmas, I'll let you into the program. This was like November. I mean, we had almost no recurring revenue. And I was like, done, deal, consider it complete. He's like, all right, go. So I remember I worked nonstop for how many days I had, cutting deals, trying everything I could, clawing and scrapping for MRR. And then finally I called him back and it was right before Christmas. I was like, we did it. I was like, when do you want us to come up to Chicago? He's like, all right, here's the dates of the program you're in. And so then we get up there and we just continue that ride, right? So we get up there and we're with 10 other companies. And at first we're like, oh, we're gonna be the, the people that don't know what they're doing. We're gonna be the ones that shouldn't really belong here. And then after a few weeks, you're like, no, we know exactly what we're doing because we have the right mindset, right? We are going after our dreams with everything we have. We are um, taking whatever resources we were given and we are maximizing them to the point that they came to us before our demo day and they said, you're going to be the last company on stage because you're the strongest company in this cohort and we want to end with you all in your pitch to the investors. So we got to get up on stage and pitch, you know, 50 plus, maybe 100 plus investors at the same time for this company. And I got off stage and a guy walks over and he goes, I don't know how much you're raising, but I'm giving you 300,000 right now. And then somebody else comes over. I don't know how much you're raising, but I got 50K for you right now. And we ended up closing over a million dollars in VC financing. But you think about that. It started on a Schwinn bicycle and then it ended with me on stage at the House of Blues pitching to millionaires and billionaires and ending up closing a round and then eventually selling that company. And it comes back to that day at the dentist's office. If I was not the kind of person that would get over myself and walk into that dentist's office, then I was not the kind of person that could receive success from the people in Chicago that day. They're the same person. I didn't become a different person. That's what people don't realize about success. It's not that you're one way and then you get successful and then you're a different way. No, no, no. You're the same way before you're successful. And that's what leads to the success. You have to be the kind of person that gets over yourself and does whatever it takes when you have nothing to show for it so that you'll be the kind of person that's actually able to receive success when that time is right. So I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but that's a little bit of my story and business and, and, and just the hustle that I bring every day to work. Yeah, no, I love it. I think lessons I get from that is one, uh, belief. 
like you have to believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing, believe in what you have to offer with, with that, um, that humble confidence or like, I'm going to go in and I'm, I'm not going to take their no for an answer, right? I'm not being a jerk, not being ego, not prideful. It's like, I just believe in me enough and, and whatever we're doing enough. Like I'm going to go in and ask for the website. I'm going to ask for tech stars, whatever it is. I think belief, I think commitment. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a mindset and making a choice. Like every day you could have found an excuse to not do it. It's hot. I should, I should be further in my career. This is embarrassing. You know, whatever they're going to say no, but you found a reason to say yes, right? You can, you can find excuses to say no or a reason to say yes. And every day it was choosing that reason. It's like, no, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep showing up. And, and that's where people want the success, however you want to label success, but they don't want to do the things that actually lead to it. And to have that humility to say, no, I'm, I'm going to claw and scrap and like whatever it takes, like I'm going to get there because that, to your point, because that's who I am. That that's what I do. And it's not, it's not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change up there. Like that's just the fruit and the result of, of the person, person that I am. Um, and you know, we talked before we got on the call of, of talking about mindset. You're like, I don't have a good mindset by, by nature. Like I'm pretty negative. You just learned to deal with that. You've learned to overcome that. You learned to lead yourself through that. And I think, I think most people would probably say that's them. Right, because we talk about mindset all the time, and I think when you look at at nature, our tendencies, I think most people probably by tendency have a negative, or skeptical, or critical mindset, um, and so they hear about positive mindset, like oh, that's just not me, and they and they don't do anything to get there. But you're saying, yeah, that that's me too, but I've learned how to lead myself. What does that look like? How did you get a positive mindset? Totally. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm by default a negative person, but I am negative at times. It definitely creeps up, and it's a part of who I am. And so um, I would say that a positive, a helpful mindset is a learned behavior. That's the first thing um, that you can learn to have a positive mindset. And let me back up even one. Why do you want a positive mindset? Your mindset dictates everything, right? It, it's the limit of your success. You will not outachieve your mindset. You just won't. Wherever your mindset is, that is the ceiling. That is the limit. That is um, the bar that you can't get past. Your mindset is what makes everything possible. So having a positive mindset is actually very important. So one of the things I do is I have an internal dialogue with myself that's always going on, right? I'm my own psychologist. I've learned to be my own psychologist. So if I wake up and I'm just feeling stress, right, or fear or uh, anger or just fill in the blank, any any negative emotion that is not going to help me succeed, right? And there's a list of them. What, what could possibly be there? I don't just live and let it live in the background. I don't just go throughout my day and let this thing like, you know, be on my shoulder, weighing me down. I don't let it be a wet blanket over me. I actually stop. Like I'll be driving to work. Let's say I'm stressed, right? I'll, I'll actually think to myself, what am I stressed about? Like name it. What is it? Is it the meeting? Is it the person I got to talk to today? Is it the thing I feel like I'm supposed to be doing that I'm not? Is it the state of the business? Like name it. Like what is it that I'm stressed about? And then I name it. And then I think, okay, now talk yourself through it. What is worst case scenario with that thing that you're stressed about? Like, go ahead and take it to its full end. What is absolute worst case scenario? So let's say it's um, a, a meeting I have and it's with a, a group of people. So last week I had a meeting with a group of investors uh, for Giant, right? And I wasn't stressed about it, but let's just use it as an example. So let's say I was stressed about going into that meeting. Um, I would say, okay, worst case scenario, uh, they fire me. Okay, well, where does that lead to? Well, I'm uh, able to be gainfully employed easily given my skill set. So what happens next? I get hired. What happens next? I find more success. Okay, is it that big a deal? Not at all, <laughs> right? I just work it through. It's like, okay, that meeting, let's say you have to have a hard conversation with an employee and you're like, okay, I can have a negative mindset about that. Worst case scenario, what happens? Uh, they're hurt and they cry. Then what? Uh, are they going to quit? Probably not. Uh, am I going to fire them? No. What's going to happen? They're probably going to grow. Okay, not that big a deal. Move on. Like, you just think, what is really the worst case here? And then you realize it's not that big a deal. Almost nothing is that big a deal. And you play your own psychologist, right? And then the other thing I like to do is to, uh, for lack of a better word, um, ask yourself, what if it works out, right? Because you think about it, we're always wondering, what if we fail? But we never walk around obsessed with the idea, what if it works out? So I've started doing this thing where I go around and whatever's happening, I think to myself, what if this works out today? Like, wouldn't that be exciting? What if this meeting goes awesome? What if this live stream is incredible? I don't come in saying, 
well, what if I fail or what if it's not good or what if I don't know what to say? I could have that self-talk and a lot of people do. I come in saying, what if I do a live stream so good that it helps somebody? What if somebody listening gets some of the, something from it and it changes their life? Wouldn't that be an amazing outcome? And then after this, I have a meeting with the, the consultants today. And so I'm going into that thinking, what if it goes incredible? What if we unlock some of their potential? What if they learn something new? What if they love Giant a little more after that meeting? But that's a different question. You don't have to ask yourself negative questions all the time. You're allowed to ask yourself positive questions about the situation you're in. Um, and so there's lots of these little hacks that I do, but I would say two of the big ones are naming the actual negative emotion that I'm having and then playing out what is worst case scenario right? So I name it and then play it through. And then the other thing is feeling the freedom to ask yourself a positive slant on the question. What if it works out? What if it's really successful? What if we win? What if everything's going to be fine? What if I go home at the end of the day and it was an incredible Monday? That's possible. So let's just talk about it in your own mind. Because really, the dialogue you have the most is with yourself. It's not with your spouse, it's not with your kids, it's not with your employees, it's not with your boss. The dialogue, the person that you actually have the most intimate relationship with is yourself. So if the dialogue that you have with yourself is off or unhelpful or negative or just you know whatever it may be, then that is gonna be a toxic relationship. You can actually have a toxic relationship with yourself and that influences all your other relationships. We're always trying to fix our lives by fixing how we relate to all these other people, but we don't actually fix how we relate to ourselves. Until you have a great way of relating to yourself, you're not going to relate to other people. And when your cup doesn't isn't filled up, you can't overflow into other people. So I would say mindset is massively important. And those are a couple little things that I do. Yeah, no, I love that. I was reading research this weekend, actually, because I, I really love the, the framing the question different, right? What if, what if it works out? What if this goes well? Um, and I was reading some research on pregame routines for sports teams. And so they, they kind of measured teams that had like the coach gave like a pump up, like hype speech or motivational speech or showed like some kind of motivational video versus a coach who was like just real tactical and maybe even talking about like things they need to make sure they fix from the previous game. Hey, make sure you do this and make sure you don't do this. The teams who had, and like we, we consider all this stuff kind of fluff. Oh, these motivational things don't work. The teams that had the motivational video or motivational speech, they always performed better. It gave them more energy, which led to higher performance because they're going out with confidence in, in um, living into that potential versus living into the fear of the failure, right? Oh, I don't want to mess Ooh. this up. I don't want to. And so it's like the, how you talk to your same thing, phrase it like, what if this goes well? Well, then you get excited. It is going to go yeah. well. Cause like, I love what I do. I love these people. This meeting is going to go great. Like they love me. I love them. It's going to go awesome. And then you walk in believing it's going to go well, which is going to shape how you perform in that meeting, in that conversation, in that whatever. So you give yourself a chance for, for better outcomes. I love that. So two things to share about that. So one, uh, my freshman year of high school was the height of my basketball career. It was where I was the best you know, relate, you know, know, in comparison to my peers. Uh, and I did something that year that I didn't do after that when I got distracted. Every single day before practice and before every single game, I had a VHS highlight film of Dominique Wilkins. I put it in and I hit play and I watched this monster play basketball for 30 minutes and then I go to practice. And when I got to practice, I felt like him. I felt like yeah. I was capable and I had a mindset that was different that year and it actually led to it. Here's the other thing, when, that whole thing of like, what if it works out, right? So I went into a meeting once and this was another story I didn't tell. So um, at one point uh, in between, or actually after the bicycle, I moved up to a moped. So I was literally driving around on a moped. Again, I was embarrassed by it. So I drove it uh, and I, I would park it to the side of the building where the people I was gonna have the meeting with wouldn't see it when I went in and had a conversation with them. So this was a financial advisor in a really wealthy neighborhood. And when I pulled up, it actually broke. The, the moped broke right in front of his office. So I had to push it over to the side and park it where he wouldn't see it. And then I go in and actually close the deal that day, um, which was awesome. But when I got in with the meeting, he said, do you have a sledgehammer uh, in, your, in your trunk? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, do you have a sledgehammer? And I was like, no. He's like, because when you came into this room today, you came to do work. He's like, you didn't come in here to just mess around. You didn't come in here to, you came in here to work. He said, you have a blue collar work ethic about a white collar environment. He goes, I really appreciate the way you came in here to really do work and you weren't gonna leave without the sale and I could feel it and I knew it and that's why you have the sale. And so I told my brother that. So here's what he gave me. I wanna show you this. It's really cool. So he sent me this down to Florida 
he put the name of our company on one side of it, but he gave me this sledgehammer as a, as a totem, as a reminder. So I keep it over my windowsill. And so I can look at it before a sales call. And I remember I'm here to do work. I'm not here to mess around. I'm not here to be lazy. I'm not here just to see what happens. I'm here to get out a sledgehammer and do work, right? Um, it's like your book, Chopping Wood, right? Keep chopping. And so it's just one of those things of like that mindset. Yeah. Well, I love that. And, and two, the other thing I made me think of is, you know, your story, you, nothing was right for you to start. It's like, oh, I didn't have enough money. I didn't have the right clothes. Didn't have the right car. Didn't have the right, didn't have the, and, and we wait for the perfect time to start. It's like now just go, just go start, go figure it out. Right. You're riding through the streets of Florida on a moped, on a bike and a 93 Zuzu trooper sweating, tired. And, and you're like, was there a better way to do it? Probably, but you just started. And, and you figured it out. And I think for, for people listening, like it's, that's the mindset. It's like you just keep showing up and, and you show up on purpose. You show up believing that good things are going to happen and entitled to nothing, grateful to everything. And you do the work, like you, you just keep showing up. Um, and it's, it's good things happen for people who show up, right? Like I, a friend of mine, once we were talking, he's a mentor of mine. He said, the world belongs to those who show up. Hmm. And it's like, cause you, cause you make things happen. And, and you and Lucas, like that's, you guys are people, one of the guys, maybe the tech stars guy, who said this to you, like your people, you just figure out a way. And like, that's kind of like, that's what I think of when I think of you and Lucas, like, yeah, they just figure out a way to make things happen. They figure out a way to do the work, to, to swing the sledgehammer. And, and the result of that, there's a lot of fruit from that, whether it's, you know, financial success, company success, life, but it's like, there's impact because of the fact that you just showed up and, and the person you are today, the family you have today, the work that you're doing today is a result of the same person who showed up, who rode a bike. who's like, I'm just going to keep figuring it out. I'm going to keep making effort. I'm not going to take no for an answer. And that takes a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of craziness involved with that. And I think that's the, the the path of greatness towards anything, right? Whether it's athletic greatness, whether it's it's business, whether it's you're, you're a teacher, like that path to greatness requires a little bit of crazy because the world's the world embraces average. Mm -hmm. And and it, and, and it gets really uncomfortable with people who are like, no, I reject that. I'm not here to be average. I wasn't made to be average. So I'm not going to live average. Even if I'm in a shack down by the river, I'm, I <laughs> refuse to believe that I'm average. Mm -hmm. And so like, and so, you, so you, because of that, you don't have an average life, but there's a lot yeah. of resistance in, in the world because that's not, that's not normal. That's not how people, how people show up. Totally. You know, I keep this uh, sign near my desk always just to remind myself, like, I'm not going to live an average life. So <laughs> it's this right here. It says part-time hustler but the part-time is marked out. I'm a full-time hustler. And when I use the word hustler, I don't mean hustling people out of their money. What I mean is hustle, sweat, work. Like I'm a full-time hustler. I'm going to do whatever it takes in any situation that I find myself in. Um, but you're right though. You have to be a little bit crazy. Um, you're not going to change the world. You're not going to put a dent in the universe. You're not going to do something that leaves a legacy. If you just watch another rerun of Seinfeld tonight, like if that's all you have going on, like no one's going to be like, oh, he changed the world. He did something incredible. He he did this. He did that. He was, he, you know, he unlocked my potential. He helped me with like, if you really want to do something, then you have to do something, right? You have to go out and sweat. And a lot of people are looking for um, some way to do it without sweat. They just mm -hmm. want a little easier path. They think there's some way that's just a little bit easier. And I've learned that you just have to put in the work, right? You'll find systems and you'll find structures and you'll find some thermals that make things a little bit easier. Um, but at the end of the day, there's no shortcut for work. Uh, my grandmother says this, and I think she may have gotten it from somewhere else. So I don't know where the uh, original quote comes from, but she said, you know, Bronson, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she's like the OG entrepreneur in our family. Actually, her mother was an entrepreneur also. I come from a long line of really strong female entrepreneurs. And at the era they lived in, uh, they were up against the grain. I mean, it was hard for them to start a business and really get things going um, you know, throughout their life. But they did it. They kept doing it. And so... Um, so she would tell me, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I've always just remembered that. And I feel the same way. If I work really hard, it's funny. Other people think, oh, you're just right place, right time. So it's like they could say, well, you just happen to know somebody that knew Mike, the president, and you happen to have coffee with him. And that was just luck. No, rewind it. Right. Mm -hmm. Why did they say that I should meet him? 
because they've been watching him and how hard he works and they've been watching me and how hard I work. And then they said, you guys should meet. So it was like, it was because of who, what they saw that they put us together. And then us together led to me meeting Jeremy and me being a part of giant and me getting to be on this show with you today. So one thing leads to another, but laziness doesn't lead to anything good, right? You got to have that work ethic and then you'll be on this snowball uh, of good things happening over time. That's right. Yeah. The world doesn't reward average, right? If I think you're just a nice guy, I don't want to introduce you to anybody. <laughs> Not because I don't like you. I just don't see, I, I don't see value in making a connection to you, to anyone else. But if you're someone who like, man, this guy just shows up. Like he does the work, crazy story, refuses to take no for an answer, shows up with work ethic, with humility. And actually, so does this guy. These two need to know each other. They're in opposite mm -hmm. worlds, whatever, like they, and, and like the world rewards that, right? Like your effort is always rewarded and it may not be now, and that's the thing again we want instant gratifications like no it, it's over time the, the fruit will be there um, but the to your point like there is no shortcut the work is the shortcut it's like all the time you're wasting trying to find the shortcut you could have just done the work and you'd be farther ahead so here's what i tell my son all the time and you all may have sons that you need to say this to um i'll say no one works harder than a lazy person they work so hard yeah. at trying to not work that they right. end up with more to do than the person who just does it so my son will have a task do the dishes. He will spend so much time trying to figure out someone else to do the dishes or a way to do them quickly. I'm just like, Micah, if you would just do the dishes, you'd be done in five minutes. Like literally, if you just went at it with, you know, with a uh, reckless abandon and you said, I'm going to do the dishes as fast as humanly possible. I'm going to do these dishes faster and better than anyone's ever done dishes. You could literally be done in five minutes, but instead you're going to put it off for two hours. Then you're going to complain for an hour. Then you're going to try to pay your little brothers to do it for a few minutes. Then you're going to do them with half effort. And then they're still not going to be great. And you wasted half the day thinking about it. Now, think about that with yourself, though, if you're watching this program. What is it that you just don't want to do? Stop. Stop complaining. Stop putting it off. Stop thinking there's an easier way. Stop. Just do it. If you actually legitimately sat down and did it, you could be done by the end of the day, probably, whatever it is. Like whatever it is, you could probably be done by the end of the day if you really wanted to. So just do it. Like no excuses, right? It's up to you to have that internal dialogue. That's like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like make the dishes the theme of my day when I can just get in, get out, move on, right? And, and we don't allow excuses from other people, so don't allow them for yourself. Right? If you're a leader and you're listening to this, you don't allow excuses from your team. Mm -hmm. Like no, just get the work done. Like the client paid for it, whatever. Like get it, get it done. Finish the project. Do the campaign. This is what you're paid to do. Like, don't make excuses. Just get it done. Same, same. But we make all these excuses for ourselves. And I think there's the realization: of like, stop making excuses. Do the work. And and where would you be if you would have done the work yesterday, or a month ago, or six? Like all these things that we keep putting off. Like you'd be so much further ahead, and you'd be celebrating progress as opposed to complaining about lack of impact, lack of action. Just yeah. just do the work. I love it. And Tracy, do you have any questions? Okay, oh, go, go ahead. Just one last thought. Some people are going to say, well. You know, now I'm going to use the excuse that I'm too far along. It's too late in the game. That's right. That's right. Had, if I had heard this 10 years ago, I'd be where I need to. No, no, no. No excuses. You're 45 today. You're 50. You're 55. You're 60. Guess what? Today's the day. You get to have the right mindset today. You get to make impact today. You get to not be lazy today. There is no right time to start. The right time to start is literally right this second with whatever you're trying to do. Yep. Love Amen. it. Okay, we've got some great questions coming in. And the first one uh, is from Joanne, who's joining us here on the Giant Platform. So she asked, what are your best practices to not let critique affect you? Oh, I love this one. Uh -huh. So here's what I do. I don't take critique from people that I don't want my life to end up like theirs. <laughs> so whenever they're saying something to me, I think, do I want their exact life? And if I don't, their critique does not matter to me, right? Um, I want to learn from it. I'm going to pull the truth out of it. I'm going to see if there's something there I can get from it. But so if, and here's what you realize, a lot of people that are critiquing you are not living lives that you wish you had. Therefore, why are you letting their critique dominate your mind? Um, another phrase I, I use a lot is don't let people rent space in your head for free, mm -hmm. right? We, we let people move into our head and just live there for years for free. And they're not thinking about you at all, but you think about them all the time. Here's the thing. If you really knew how self-centered everyone is, you realize they're not thinking about you. And they might've said that critique flippantly, not even thinking about it. And now you're gonna live with it forever. What? 
Like they forgot they said it after they said it because to them it was just this offhanded remark and they were having a bad day. And now you're going to walk around with this wet blanket over you for the rest of your life because somebody was having a bad day, right? So if you don't want to be just like them, don't let critique bother you. Don't let people rent space in your head for free. And they probably said it flippantly and they're not even thinking about you anymore, but now you're thinking about them. And there's an asymmetry there that's insane. I love it. We, we always awesome. think everyone's like thinking, going through their whole day, thinking about how to like make our lives worse. Right. Like there are my employees are just trying to like be against me. My bot. No, they're not thinking about you. They're all worried about about themselves. And I love this quote from uh, from Dabo Swinney, Clemson's football coach he said, never worry about criticism from someone you wouldn't seek advice from. That's a better version of what I was trying to say. Right. Let's go with like, that. That's the piece. It's like if, if I don't if I don't want my life to be like theirs and I'm, I don't need to take their their critique. That's great. Okay, here's another one. And this person obviously knows our language really well because they're going to talk about the five voices. So I just want to let you all know who are maybe joining us from LinkedIn or Facebook. If you don't have a free account from Giant, you must right now just go to giant.tv slash free account because this will make a little bit more sense when you know more about our language. But Cassidy says, I'm a creative connector and my husband, who is a guardian nurturer, keeps saying I'm too risky when it comes to my business ideas. I feel like he holds me back. What do I do? Yeah, so I was in a similar situation, not the same voice types, right? But a similar situation. Um, when my businesses weren't successful, I remember I came to my wife and I was like, hey, I'm gonna start another one. And her exact phrase was something along the lines of, another one? You're going to start another one. And I remember I, I said something like, okay, I know it doesn't make sense now, but I have to keep trying at this so that something will work, right? And so, I, I was gentle with it because I understood her fear of like, you know, she's a nurturer and she, you know, to her, it was the, okay, do we have the resources for this? Is this the right move? She's not a risk taker. She's adverse to that. And for me, I knew that I was going to live in the shack forever if I didn't figure it out. I had to like keep trying stuff. I couldn't stop trying stuff. So it was really just good conversations. I understood where she was coming from. So I didn't get mad at her. I was like, no, I, I understand that, you know, it's fearful to you for me to keep doing this. It, it, it's hard. But, but I have to. It is the right path. And in hindsight, we'll see that. Just give me a little more leeway. Let, let me you know, go a little longer. So it was just a healthy conversation. I mean, we loved each other and that love came across in the conversations we had. Um, she gave me the freedom to keep trying things when all signs looked like it was all going to fail. Like she kept giving me that freedom. And I am like forever grateful because there are lots of wives that would just said, nope, that's it. It's time to get a nine to five. It's time to maximize your earning potential. You're uh, you know, qualified to make a lot more than you are. You're going to stop playing entrepreneur. She never said that to me. She let me keep trying. So I would just say, have really good conversations. Know where they're coming from. They're not actually trying to hold you back. They just see the world differently, right? My wife wasn't trying to hold me back. She just saw the world differently. Um, so I think dialogue um, and just really expressing to them what it is about your business ideas. Like, why do you need them? What is it? And, you know, I had enough raw conversations with my wife where she knew that if I didn't explore these business ideas, that a part of me was going to die forever. And she didn't want to be married to a husband that had a part of him dead forever. So she would willingly do what needed to happen to make, uh, to make me be alive the rest of her life. And I think looking back, neither of us would change the way it played out. So healthy conversation around that. Yeah. That's a healthy marriage right there. That's great. Well, to piggyback onto this, Brandon asked something very similar, which I'm curious about as well. <clears throat> did you ever consider getting a regular job and just working for someone else? Or did you always know you'd be an entrepreneur? So I've said many times I am unemployable. <laughs> and what I mean by that is uh, I'm not a good employee because I'm a great entrepreneur and great entrepreneurs make bad employees um, because they think they have a better way. They want it to do it their way. They know all the things that are broken about this or that, or, you know, they're seeing opportunities that other people don't want to tackle. So, yeah, for a long time, I've known I was supposed to be an entrepreneur. Now, in a past life, I was an entrepreneur. So I was an entrepreneur inside of an organization. It didn't work out. Um, I was there for 10 years. I kept trying to be an innovative voice inside the organization. And I actually became uh, a negative voice inside the organization because my desire for change in a very guardian atmosphere um, was not accepted. And even after a decade of trying to change something from within, I realized it was time for me to go. And we left on really great terms. Like, they love me. I love them. But it wasn't a great working relationship. And so I knew at that moment, I was like, 
I have to be an entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur. Uh, my ideas are too big and a little bit too risky and a little bit too scary um, and a little bit too bold. And I'm going to work a little bit too hard and it makes everybody a little bit too unsettled around me. And so I need to really go do my own thing. So I always did know in the back of my mind, I've also said this, and this is important. I said, I'll do whatever I have to do to feed my family. That's more important than playing entrepreneur. So I've always said, if I cannot find a way for entrepreneurship to work, I will go flip burgers at McDonald's if I have to. And I will go be a sales rep for some tech company. I'll go be a manager. I'll do anything. Like I literally, nothing is beneath me. I will do anything I have to do to provide for my family. But if I can find a way to be an entrepreneur, that's what I'm going to fight for. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's the end of my questions, uh, Kevin. So uh, Bronson, that was super insightful. Uh, yeah. I love it. I love it. Friends, hopefully that was, I know it was useful. I'm not going to say hopefully. I know that was useful. Uh, I know you got multiple things out of that. Um, Bronson, thank you for your time. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for the way that you lead Giant. Um, thanks for living into your voice. Like your innovation makes the world better, um, especially as it relates to Giant, because now that innovation is is unlocking the potential of leaders and teams and organizations and families. Um, and so it's generational impact that that you are having because of your mindset, because of your commitment, because of your hustle. Um, so grateful for you, grateful for your leadership and your friendship. Uh, thanks for hanging out on the Monday Mindset. Yeah, this is awesome, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. I love the show. I love watching it. I love learning from you. So great job. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.